Uh, we're now here for this uh, training workshop um, of communicating your research, uh, mostly communicating your research through uh, online and on social media, which will be given by Francesco Martino, who is the webmaster at the European University Institute and has been very active in uh, um, assisting researchers uh, on the, with their online presence. So I give him the floor for a presentation of about 20 minutes and then uh, we'll open the floor for questions and, uh, and inputs. Okay, thanks Eli, and uh, good afternoon everyone. So I'm Francesco, and uh, as Eli said, uh, I work at the European National Institute, which is a research center in Florence that probably many of you already know. So I'm very happy to be here today uh, to share my experience uh, at the UI with uh, communication tools, digital communication tools for researchers, and hopefully, to exchange our experiences, ideas, and, and, and to get your feedback uh, later on in questions and answers, or later also in the afternoon or tomorrow, anytime. So uh, I'll give this 20 minutes presentation, and I thought it was a good uh, starting point just to show you very briefly in a couple of minutes what are the communication tools that we offer to our researchers at the UI. So at the UI, we've created this uh, internet portal uh, where on a self service uh, mode, uh, all UI researchers can go and uh, learn what services they can get, uh, apply for them, or even actually start uh, a website uh, when, when possible and when available. Um, so we, have, we offer to researchers three different kinds of websites. Those are uh, three uh, platforms that are very, very similar from a, from a technical point of view. What makes them different? Uh, it's the customization, it's the design and the tools that we add to each one of those uh, to serve the scope that they're meant for. So we have personal websites, blogs and project websites. And for example, personal websites are obviously uh, meant at communicating and making accessible information about a specific person, specific UI researchers under the UI.tu umbrella. Uh, while blogs, it's something similar, uh, but for more people. So it's a group of researchers, even coming from different departments, who might want to start a blog to communicate ideas and publish news and articles about, around, a specific theme uh, that is relevant for their research and for the UI. Uh, project websites, still something similar, but for working groups. For example, this is an annual event that we have at the UI, it's called the State of the Union. Uh, so, uh, researchers who are working in a working group or organizing an event can apply and get a website for their uh, working group or for their conference. All of these three platforms come with a very powerful blog section that is then aggregated and presented to the end users uh, in, a, in a unique access point and integrated with all our social media. So all these services uh, that we offer to the, to the, to the researchers, uh, we try our best to make them extremely easy to use, extremely user-friendly, and we provide 24-7 monitoring and assistance. We guarantee that they are up, that they work well, uh, that they are usable. We always offer continuously all year long trainings and uh, user-friendly documentation. So there is a whole team of specialists behind it that daily work uh, to make these services uh, operational and easy to use and to very well serve the scope that they are meant for. So this is the end of my introduction on the services. We can come back to any of those if you want a question and answer. But uh, what I would like to do now is to start our discussion asking uh, why uh, the UI, a research center like the UI or other research center, universities in general, they are investing in this kind of digital communication tool, like it be a blog or social media channels. Um, and of course, I don't have uh, the correct or the right answer to this question, whether it's worth it or not for universities and research centers to invest in this kind of tools. Uh, all I can do today is to bring our experience and have you uh, why, in my experience, I found that they could be useful or not for a research center. And uh, for sure, I, I found out that working with this tool in the last uh, few years, uh, they can be extremely useful to extend the accessibility and to communicate the research that is done by our researchers uh, to a different kind of audience, which is not academics, that can still go uh, to academic repositories. All these tools are not meant to replace the academic uh, repositories and the official academic uh, tools 
tools that are used by, by all of you to publish your research. Uh, these communication tools are very useful if you want to communicate your research to a different audience, to a wider audience that often is beyond uh, the worlds of academia, beyond the worlds of your university, uh, and often is a non-specialist audience. Uh, another thing that I found out in my experience is that for sure these, these keywords, branding, create a buzz, get likes, and measure the success of these, uh, of these tools, through the number of page views that you get, or through the number of likes that you get, to get viral, as is often said. Uh, it's not something that uh, that's, uh, uh, non-universities or even new researchers should aim at. I've seen that in my experience, uh, this can be misleading targets to get, to get visible, to get viral, to get likes. Uh, can be maybe exciting if you succeed in the very short term, but in the long term, it doesn't bring, it doesn't add any value to, to your uh, reputation online or even to the, to the branding of the, of the institute where you are. So assuming that is it a good idea, uh, to, is it worth for universities and research centers to invest in, in, in developing tools and then can be offered to you to communicate online, to create a blog, to create social media channels. I think that's the why is still there, because it's why would you, researchers, would invest your time in, in, in using such a tools, so that these tools to communicate to a non-special audience, to get beyond the walls of academia and around the walls of research. Um, and again here, I don't have the answer. Uh, you will probably uh, have different feedback and different opinion, which I would be very interested in discussing. But uh, again, again, what I can bring on the table today, it's, it's my own experience. Uh, and I found out that there are three uh, positive aspects of doing so, of investing your time. Uh, one, I call it ethics, uh, and uh, I can explain it with these words. You are specialists in your subject. You are people who are uh, researching around the field since many years. And uh, uh, today, I see that there is a lot of demand for a very high, uh, a culturally advanced feedback on specific theme that then affect uh, a, big, a big society, a normal society, a non-specialist audience. So I think one of the missions should be to bring your specialized and, and uh, a very uh, culturally advanced experience on some hot topics. I put, for example, the screenshot of, of this blog post, which is written by by uh, Oliver Gardner, who is a friend, and he's a lawyer from the UK, uh, researching at the UI. He's an EY researcher. And Oli is researching on things that are relevant for the impact that Brexit could have on, on the life of, every, of all of us. Uh, and I think it's a privilege for me and for everybody else to have access to an easy tool to read what Oli thinks about uh, the possible impact of Brexit without have being an academic, so without speaking or understanding the academic language, or without having access to advanced or specific academic repositories. So, other two aspects that might be uh, a good reason for you to invest your time in creating a blog or a, or a social platform is uh, to get back some authority. Uh, you might probably have heard that uh, the, the digital has changed communication deeply and shifted trust from branding, from organization, to uh, peer what is called peer communications. Today, people tend to trust uh, their group of friends, and they look up at branding or official organization less and less. Uh, I tend to trust my group of friends, which I know, and to be able to communicate at your level can give you back some authority and contribute to build up your reputation online. And uh, uh, another aspect, the third aspect, is definitely networking. All these tools are efficiently and powerful to communicate with people all over the world in a faster way. So uh, even if you're talking to a non-specialist audience, you might end up creating contacts uh, that can bring you to have collaborators or feedback or uh, a more collaborative and inclusive approach on your research team. You might find that there's somebody else uh, writing or commenting from the other from, from uh, uh, the other side of the world about something that is relevant for you or for your uh, for your research. So it's a great uh, chance to extend your networking. So I 
again, assuming that it's a good idea for universities to, to invest in these tools and, and, and it's a good idea for you to invest your time, which is so valuable, in creating the online communication, still you get to yet another question, which is how to do it properly, which is not an easy one. Uh, I think that the most important thing I can tell you, it sounds obvious, but if you want to have your uh, own successful online communication on a blog, on a website, or on social media, you must have a clear and well-defined strategy. To just start a blog, I've seen it so many times. It's very exciting at the beginning. Without a strategy, everything looks easy, and you get the feeling that you can finally reach out and talk, reach out and talk to so many people. But then, after the first moments of excitement, in the best case scenario, you end up in a situation where you feel you are losing your time because you don't get the feedback you wanted, you get, don't get the visits you were expecting, or if you get bored and leave everything there and things get old, an old website, non, non taking care website, can even in the worst case scenario bring uh, to, uh, to hurt your reputation online. So you have wasted your time and you didn't bring anything good to your image. So for sure, you need to define your audience and you need to talk to your audience uh, uh, and you need to define goals and find ways to measure goals. And the most difficult thing uh, to communicate at the beginning, uh, to when I, when I talk with researchers, is that visibility, likes, page views, they are not a goal. They can be a way of reaching some goals, but they are not a goal. A goal could be to bring more people from a specific academic area to a conference to share their papers and their ideas. Or a goal could be to sell more copies of my book. A goal could be for a university to have more uh, high quality applications for a PhD grant from a specific university in a specific field. That's a goal that is very measurable and where online communication can support. So, uh, to get more specific, to give you some practical uh, suggestions, if you are already online, if you are thinking about being online, there is something that I would definitely recommend you to learn, which is uh, writing for the web. Out there, there is a lot of uh, training, courses, material that you can find. Uh, writing for the web is definitely something different than writing for an academic publication, a printed publication. Uh, and uh, sometimes you academics tend, for example, to start with a, with, a, with a theory and then develop it and then bring in some ideas, some feedbacks. And then after 7,000 words, get some conclusions. And uh, sometimes, in, in some specific platforms, reshuffling or changing the other way around the order of these elements can improve the effectiveness for you to talk with the audience that you want to reach out. So maybe to start with some conclusions and then explain in, in a clear way the narrative that is behind it and maybe point, link academic references for people who might be interested in uh, not uh, keeping it so just superficial, but deep in the, the, the topic, uh, can, can already completely change the outcome of your blog post. Another important thing that I like to, uh, that I definitely suggest to learn about is how to use images correctly, which I would summarize in mainly two aspects. One is how to pick the right image. For sure, today, you should not use stock photos, in my opinion. I should use photos that can definitely uh, and effectively support uh, your, 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 your news, your article, in a, in a genuine and more uh, real way. Uh, and another aspect of using images is uh, definitely to learn uh, how to use images correctly in, the, in, in, the, in terms of copyright issues and licenses. To use a copyright protected image for your article can really hurt your web reputation. You should know there's tons of repositories where you can find free made images, or you can take images yourself with your smartphone. Uh, and also, there are, before I told you, you should define your audience and define and measure your goals. There are trainings, there's documentation, there's very specific approaches to do that. It's, not some, it's something you can learn and that I would recommend you to learn. Uh, of course, to have a, a good and an efficient and a, a positive uh, online presence also uh, needs other ingredients. Uh, and uh, if you if you are passionate with uh, technology, uh, you can definitely learn everything, all of this. But I imagine that many of you, historians, political scientists, 
maybe you don't have time to learn how to choose the right platform. That requires, to choose the right platform requires a lot of experience, requires a lot of uh, technical skills, understanding, and uh, it's continuously changing. So it's something that if you don't know how to do, I definitely recommend you to ask to an expert, as well as graphic design, which is not just about I like this or I like that. It's about making sure that what you're writing is accessible from any kind of mobile phone, with any kind of browsers, with any kind of internet connection. To, to make a mistake in choosing the graphic design just because you like it may, might affect your communication in the sense that maybe people with an iPhone 5 cannot read it because that design doesn't work there. So it's something that I would definitely recommend you to choose together with an expert. Of course, giving your feedback about what you like and what you don't like, but it's, it's, a, it's a choice that must be done by an expert. Search engine optimization as well, if and when it's needed. We can dig in this if you want later. I'm not going into business because this is a big topic. But if and when needed, it's something for experts. As well as integration with other, with other tools like social media. I want to use uh, instant articles uh, rather than Google IMP. I don't know if you're familiar with these words. So, to conclude this part, I'm going to give you some practical examples. Uh, something that very often I have ended up discussing with many researchers at the UI or even professors, it's, you know, when you go online, we, we, we try to uh, support all our, all our people with, with content strategy guidelines. Uh, so, for example, we say, okay, on this platform, on this blog, if you want to write about this topic, it should be the length of the, of, the, of the news, of the article, should not be over 500 words. And a lot of times we end up in a discussion, but my complex that I have to explain is extremely complicated. I cannot just dump it down in a simple way in 500 words. It's, it's, I cannot, I'm a researcher, I'm researching on that. And my feedback is, please, never dump it down. Never turn something complex into something simple. Because that will not bring anything to you. There is a difference between, in my, in my opinion in my, and my experience, there is a difference between simplicity and clarity. You should not dumb it down and make it simple, but you should try to make it clear. Because on that, on that platform, this is a blog post that is read with Google AMP, on that platform you will not find uh, academics or researchers, you, you, you'll, not, you'll find just non-specialist audience and you need to be clear with them, otherwise you, you'll miss your goal which is to talk to a different kind of audience. So, and there are ways to clear it, uh, to, to clear, to make, it, to make something that is complex, uh, to express it in a clear way. I don't know, you can maybe start explaining that it's a complex topic and why it is complex. And maybe you can suggest to the users the steps that people could take to understand better. Uh, if you can explain that in a clear way, it's, it's, already, it's already a lot. People understand that they, they cannot judge the impact of Brexit uh, in five minutes. It, re it would require uh, a more, more time or a more advanced way of getting information. And you maybe can indicate how to get this information and how to understand it. That would already, already be a lot. Uh, okay, another example is about images. I have already um, mentioned that I would definitely not recommend to use stock images. These images are not a joke. They were uh, chosen by uh, big companies. They were very effective 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. But today they are no longer effective. Smiling actors or uh, cool managers that draw an upward line on a, on, a, on a blackboard are not working anymore. There's now like corporate communications and I told you right at the beginning. And today this is just fading away. What works today is I'm real. I'm talking about what I studied in the last 10 years. And that's my opinion. So I'd rather take a photo with your phone that maybe is not as shiny, but communicate this reality and this clarity rather than advertising or, or, or top-down communication that is done by organizations. Uh, and another example is uh, when you start something, I always, I always see that at the beginning there is so much excitement that people want to publish a blog post uh, a week uh, or even one a day, and uh, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, enthusiasm. 
enthusiasm. But if you don't plan it well, and if you don't uh, make a plan also of the time and the resources that you will have available in the next six months, one year, uh, one year and a half, you might end up in a situation where your home page doesn't look anymore like something up to date and, and well taken care of, but it looks like something that's just left there. And as I told you, best case scenario, nobody lost it. Worst case, that can even hurt your web reputation. So, uh, 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 the last advice on this is that you should definitely think long term. Think about your online presence as something that will last long term. So keep control. Try to make a plan, uh, get some help if you need, but don't just start something without having a plan of what, how much time will you be able to dedicate in the next at least 12 months, at least. So, <coughs> sorry. I switch now to social media, and uh, again, uh, the, the, the question is always the same, why, how can they be useful, and again, all I can do is not give you the, the, the answer, because I, unfortunately I don't have it, but uh, I, can, I can tell you what in my experience I've seen that social media can be good at, or can have some return to you and to, and to the university or the research center that hosts you. So you can use them to talk to your audience, if you have a Facebook page or Twitter channel <coughs> or a Telegram channel, you will be able to talk to your audience in a very fast and effective way and accessible. Social media makes sure that they are accessible from any kind of device because it's their business. They will take care of that. You will not have to deal with any technical thing. It's just about content. Social media are all about content. You can use them to extend the accessibility of content that is somewhere else. If you have a blog, you can have, I don't know, Facebook page or a Twitter channel where regularly, every Monday morning, you will link and with a sentence announce your latest post. And this would work. Social media would positively and effectively support your, your communication on the blog. You can also use them to create some discussion around the content that you have created. I, I write an article about Brexit and then I, I share it to have comments there. Because social media are very good for comments. But to implement a commenting platform on, 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 on your website, it's more complicated to implement it and to manage it. Uh, this is a very creative thing. I put it there just to warn you, because I thought it was the best, the most effective way of uh, passing this concept. Every action that you do on social media, it's an information about you that you're giving to the social media which are not charity uh, organization. They are for profit organization that will monetize the information they have about you. How will they monetize it? Just offering to advertisers filters to target you. Every action, a page that you like is an information that you give about yourself. A page where you comment on, a check in in a place, uh, a link that you share, all these things are information about you that they end up now, like, oh, this is a very creative advertisement, but they are offered to advertise it to target you. Uh, we at the UI have done uh, uh, paid Facebook advertisements, and you can target people who study uh, law at the LSC, and they are in their third year, and they like these pages, and they have been to these places. And you can show to them a very targeted advertisement. Okay? So, when you use social media, something that you should be really aware of is that every information that you're giving it will be public and that you must be you have to be happy to share it. So keep control of the information. That's that's the message that I'm giving you. Probably you're already aware of that, but I think it's always worth to remind when we talk with people who are not digital communications experts to know these kind of things. So uh, something that really works on social media is definitely frequency. Uh, and using the same format. Uh, if you can create a pattern, especially if you're starting from scratch, uh, so you, need, you have the, the, the most common problem that everybody has when you start social media, which is I want to grow me some followers. I start with my Twitter account, but I have 19 followers, which are all my friends. I would like to get at least to 500 or 1,000 just to do professional. And uh, uh, I'm not going to be uh, extremely strict on this. I will tell you, like, numbers of followers are completely pointless. They are pointless to reach your goals, which is to sell more books or to have more applications for, from a specific uh, profile. 
but they can be effective when you want to present yourself. Uh, they can be, it, it can be nice to say, okay, this is my Twitter account. You go there and say, a thousand people follow me, okay. People can, can say, this must be, must be saying something interesting. So when you want to start, something that is very effective is to create a pattern. That's, uh, that's the clarity that I was mentioning before. Clarity, something that is accessible, engage people, makes it easier for people to understand. For example, every Monday morning, we publish the uh, agenda of the events of the week with the same uh, words and with the same uh, photos. Sorry. And with the same photos. Let's cut. So that people could recognize it and they are more likely to, to, to follow our account to get this reminder every morning. Okay? It's a recurring pattern that works very really well. Uh, on social media, you can do all kind of uh, marketing with a budget or without a budget to increase the number of relevant people. Uh, this is, for example, that I'm showing. It's an advertisement that we did for our PhD grants campaign uh, where we were targeting a very specific audience. And as you can see, we got so many likes on this on this photo, but that was not what we were monitoring or caring about. But with this advertisement, we were deciding whether to keep it or not, because we ran multiple advertisements in parallel, just monitoring the number of conversions, the number of people who click on that link and go to our PhD information page and then register. I don't care if I get 5,000 likes. I get if I get five good, people registered to, uh, to apply to the PhD program, okay? This again, it's a video that we have advertised for the same purpose, and as you can see, Facebook shows you people reached of almost half a million, and you get, wow, half a million people. That's very effective when you go and present the results of your campaign to your boss, but that's not what we were aimed at. That's not what we were looking for. Social media will tend to show you great numbers because they, it's, it's tempting to say, like, oh, I can reach all these people, I'm going to throw more money there. But don't get into this trap. Follow your objectives, monitor them, and if Facebook turns out that this advertisement was not creating any conversion, I can reach even 5 billion people, but I'm not going to run it any longer because no one is, 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 is relevant for me. So uh, to conclude, I also, I also, I'm not going to go into details with this social media. You maybe probably know them better than me because you use them. I just use them to try them out, but you use them maybe with a more uh, relevant uh, profile. And um, I have added also Google Scholar, which is not a social media for researchers, but I have added it in these slides because uh, Google Scholar since a couple of years allows you to have your profile page. And uh, I've seen, I've heard and seen online or even heard when I go to conferences or talk to people uh, that do, do a similar job that I do, that there is this word ASEO. Uh, you know what does that mean? Connected to Google Scholar. It's, it's academic search engine optimization. So there's people who offer you collaboration and tools and uh, advice on how to improve your ranking in Google Scholars for specific keywords. So it's kind of working uh, similar to what uh, social media would do. Um, the last social media that I would mention is, is uh, Telegram. I don't know if you know Telegram, if you know how does it work. If you don't, I'm not going to explain it now because that will make uh, my presentation too long. Uh, but if you want, we can talk about it anytime, today or tomorrow. Uh, Telegram is growing in a very fast way. It's growing in a very fast way, and today, uh, if I have to give a very superficial recommendation, when I start my, my, my new uh, online communication, I definitely recommend to have a look at Telegram. It can be a very effective tool, and we are at the beginning, so as first movers, you will have all the benefits that people who created the Twitter account five or six years ago are having today. So I definitely, it's definitely something that I, will, that I recommend you to, to look at. So this is my last slide, and it's uh, some quick takeaways that I hope I can leave to you. Uh, if you if you don't want to read them all now, uh, I'll be happy to share my presentation uh, anytime. Get in touch with me, uh, or I'm, I'm going to be around here all day today and uh, all day tomorrow. So I'll be happy to learn from you, to have comments. Uh, I think it's 
a great chance that I have being here to, to exchange opinions with you. So thank you very much, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm here. Thank you, Francesco, for the, this very interesting presentation on the issues that we're not all always very aware of. Uh, I'll now open the, the floor uh, for questions. Um, so please feel free to ask your questions, and I'll just pass on the microphone. Thank you. What do you think about academia's recent neoliberal uh, tuition fee thing? Now it's charging people. Okay, thanks for asking and thanks for letting me know because I didn't know. <laughs> so, you but, to, uh, but... You have to prepare, you can prepare a professional account where you can see your citations, citations and mentions. What, which, which is what Google Scholar does for free. But academia is this uh, kind of... I'm just worried that in, in the vein of communicating research you also get part of something that you're trying to get out from, for instance, you're trying to get out from this very high-ranked journal mafia thing, and now you are <laughs> kind of getting stuck in social media. So, is there an end to that? Or yeah. So again, thanks for for the question and for uh, letting me know. I didn't know. In in my last slides, I didn't stress enough, but I brought your ideas and opinions and findings, the information that you own and share. That's the value. It's not the tools. A blog is, doesn't have any value. Facebook doesn't have their containers, their communication tools. So academia.edu, I think, I don't know now the details, but I, I make an hypothesis. They're trying to monetize all the work that they have done so far. And the way they monetize it, if they cannot, uh, like Google or Facebook, sell information to advertisers to monetize it, they try to monetize it by selling you the service. So I, I, I would not be surprised if there is uh, tools, platforms that offer a free service and cool, and once they get you, they start selling you the service. Uh, I'm not sure uh, on what terms, but I also have that Medium now is offering a, play, a paid plan. And uh, if you start with a blog on Medium, now you know, your information is, is used to create these values, to be monetized. So whenever you can, my advice is whenever you can, rely on uh, uh, your university for this kind of support for having uh, uh, your information uh, taken care of. Because your university is less likely to use your information to monetize it. Private companies do. In some cases, it's, it's uh, inevitable to do it. Because Google Scholar, it's working so well that you can not just <coughs> ignore it. But when you can, you have to rely on things with your university. That's my advice. I have a question. Now, you show uh, some very, I mean, all these, these different platforms that you show, uh, and they're all, they all look very nice, and they all look very professional, and then they hosted in this uh, bigger website, which really engage them. How do you do if your university doesn't provide the support? Now, you are the person who does it for one university, but I am an individual researcher. Maybe my university doesn't provide such services. Where do I start if I want to make a page, if I want to um, yeah, try and now be present online? Where do I start if I have just my university page where it says my name and my position? Well, uh, this is a good uh, case of uh, an answer that it's complex, so I don't want to dumb it down, but I'll try to make it clear what my, what my suggestion is. And uh, it, I mean, it, it's something that it's, it's a common situation. Not all universities invest in this or in, in these tools. We are a fairly small community, so maybe we, we have more uh, um, margin to, to, to move uh, if compared to other big realities. Uh, of course, you'll end up being in a, in a platform outside. So maybe it could be WordPress online, WordPress.org, or Medium, or anything else. And uh, uh, there is no the best the, 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 the right platform doesn't exist but what I would recommend you to do is to get all the information you can take some time make your strategy and see what platform offer you the best service for your strategy to make a communication strategy online takes nothing less than a few weeks and up to several months one year 
you should list, you should describe your audience, you should, you should make a calculation of the time that you can dedicate, and then you can start maybe an expert how to find the platform. So my suggestion is have a very uh, conscious approach. Then if you want, I can also mention a few platforms that, uh, no, I don't, don't want to get into details, but uh, because everyone has his own preferences. And I know the, the platforms that I know, I don't know them all. And I don't have experience with everything, but I can tell you some platforms that are working really well. For example, WordPress.com. WordPress.com is extremely easy to use. It's extremely user-oriented and it's extremely accessibility-oriented. So if you follow all the guidelines, your blog will for sure be accessible by with any kind of device, uh, to blind people, and so forth and so on. Um, we might also want to think beyond blogs to publish, for example, on um, demo how is it called? Um, democracy, I, I forgot now. The, uh, so the, it's basically a blog about our democracy, I think it's called. Um, and. Um, it's, it's a centralized blog uh, or, or kind of an online magazine type of thing. And what advice would you give uh, to, to post on these blogs that naturally have more visibility uh, on the web? Well, uh, if you can use a platform that is already existing, that's a great opportunity. And I definitely recommend you to do it. Just make sure that the platform is right for your audience. Just go and do a little research of who is reading that 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 specific blog uh, and uh, and uh, what kind of audience is there and uh, and uh, then if there is a match, is that audience? It's exactly the audience that you want to reach out. Yes, do it. Uh, look at the LSE blogs. There are so many blog posts that are written by people who are not from the LSE are just guest authors. We offer the same thing. We are not as popular as the SDC blogs. But on the UI blogs, you can be a guest owner. Uh, and it's something that we encourage a lot. Uh, because a blog is around a thing and has a, a well-established, big or small, doesn't matter, well-established audience. And everything that is relevant for the audience, it's a good match for the blogs and for the writer. And uh, one more thing that I would add is that when you write content, uh, Usually, unless you sell it or unless you sign off some agreements, the content is yours. On the UI blogs, if you want to call, close it, if you have a UI personal page and you want to close it and migrate somewhere else, you can send us a request and within a week, we give you all your information in a pen drive in a standard format so that you can easily upload it anywhere else. The information is the real value and it's yours. Okay? Just to say the real the name I forgot was OpenDemocracy.net, uh, which is a widely read uh, platform. Yeah. Well, for sure, if you have access to already well established uh, online platforms and they are good for you. Of course. Of course. I have something for you. Yeah. <laughs> Just very short comment. Um, Another good platform, I think, a different conversation for the UK, where it's run by uh, former journalists who actually help academics transform legal texts or very complex uh, scholarly texts into the uh, just text for a general audience, you know, just the complex legal terms sometimes, or the structure is not uh, meant for, for the people who are not well aware of the subject. So maybe uh, it's worth just to look at this website as well. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for pointing it out. I'm going to have a look at that too. Uh, thank you very much, Francesca, for our presentation. I, I think it was very useful, actually. <laughs> um, I just had the one question regarding the use of image online. Are there some basic rules in terms of copyright? Can, can we just copy and paste any type of, any type of uh, images? I don't know. Do you have any guidelines? Yeah. Basic ones? For, for, for a DUI, for our researchers, uh, we, we share a documentation which is very long about using images, but also a, a, we call it a cheat sheet, where you can get in a page all the basic information. And if you're interested, I'll be happy to share with you in a, in a private way, I'm not publish them, but I, I can share them with you, the long and the short one. Uh, but 
to answer your question in a very brief way, uh, from a copyright point of view, you must use only images that you are allowed to use. The easiest way to do that is go on Flickr, search, throw there a search keyword, for example, migration. Okay? You'll find a million images of migrants coming, of relevant things. Flickr is a big database of images. Then you uh, are able to filter the results uh, per license. And you can just uh, filter, show me only the photos that are uh, Creative Commons free to use. And you'll find so many options. And when you find the, the image that you like, that is good for your blog post, for your communication, you can use that for sure, uh, usually under the condition of citing the author. Okay? So you just, but it's just a copy paste. The citation, the credit, it's something that's already prepared there. There's a button, you can copy, and then when you paste the image, remember to put the credit down. And you're 100% sure that's your image, you have full rights to use it. You can do exactly the same thing on Google Images. And another maybe very useful tip is that if you have an image, but you don't know whether you're free or not to use it, there is image reverse search engines. Uh, one is called TINI, T-I-N-Y-E. Okay? It was the first reverse image search. It means that you can search you can upload an image, and then I will show you all the places where the images, that image is used, and you will and it forms about the copyright. And now also Google Images offer the same service. You can go on Google Images, and you can search instead of by keywords by uploading an image, and it will tell you all the information about it. You're welcome. question came to my mind. Um, let's assume I publish uh, an article in a journal that has a paywall or uh, that I can only access through my university and then I want to blog about this and I want to use a table or a figure of that article. Okay, that's, that's a question that you should ask your lawyer. I'm sure here with some buckets. <laughs> but in general, if you if you sell the exclusivity on, on, a, on a content, whatever it is, a paper, a multimedia file, an image, to somebody and they have the exclusive usage of that, you cannot use part of it. What you can do, you can ask the, the, the online repository if you can use it. Like if you write a book, you, in theory, you're not allowed to use part of the books in your blogs, but you can uh, ask the, the, the company and publish your book to do it. However, I would add that it would not be a good idea to write a blog post when you maybe say, ah, I have this idea, you can find more information here, and then your readers click, and they have to pay to read it. That doesn't look very good. Yeah. If you do it, inform. Like, I'm writing this thing, but I warned at the beginning that read a full article, you will be paid. You will be asked to pay. Always be fair with your audience. Be clear. to ask you about this ASEO, ASEO uh, the okay. optimization uh, engine and do you, do you think we need it um, given that we have all these different tools and yeah shall we consider it or you just give it for, for our common culture on communication <laughs> I'm gonna tell you something that uh, I guess most of uh, uh, my colleagues uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a technical person also also working with content strategy, uh, I'm sure, pretty sure that my colleagues would have, most of them would have a different opinion. But my answer is no. You don't need any SEO, you don't need any, any ASEO. This is why before I said, if and when you need it, like put it in the hands for specialists. But if and when you need it. I know that Google Scholar is ranking a lot. Google uh, algorithms are never public. But I know that uh, that uh, Google Scholar is uh, giving a lot of advantages to uh, articles that have a lot of citations. So that's a big thing. So uh, the best thing that you can do for your ASEO is to get a lot of citations. <laughs> and uh, there's many uh, um, official and maybe non-conventional ways of getting that. 
you academics know a lot more than me in this field, I guess. I have maybe one last question, but also regarding the the the, the I made a table, you can quote yourself. It's always a, the you get more sensation. Quote yourself. Don't let me extract from there. <laughs> no, I have um, a practical uh, application. I'm a, a, a young researcher with limited technical skills. Uh, and my university uh, basically offers nothing. I have a web page with uh, my name, a PhD, and uh, maybe two lines about me. Again, I have limited technical skills. Where should I start? Do I, do I tweet? Do I uh, invest this time to make a, a web page? Because we talk about the LSE blog. Then the LSE blog, I can always try and publish it. I'll send it a blog, and if they want it, they'll do it. But myself, where do I start really? with my low skills? Yeah, uh, I, I feel good giving you this answer because you're academics, you are used to complexity and you're used to difficult answers. So with any other different audience, uh, my answer would be boring. But with you, I'm expecting to be an okay answer to tell you like, no, do not tweet, do not move a finger. As long as you don't get either help or learn more about uh, tech, you improve your technical skills. Don't start tweeting if you're not familiar with the thing, if you're not a clear strategy, if you don't know what to expect and how to measure what, if what you're doing is good, don't start it. Because best case scenario, you're wasting your time. Worst case scenario, you're hurting your web reputation. So my uh, answer would be the boring way of learning, reading, talking to friends who know more, and trying to get more uh, aware and conscious of what you can do and what you cannot do. mentioning LinkedIn. So what do you think about LinkedIn and academics? Shall we? Uh, I need to think about it because I don't have a, um, an immediate answer. So I do have a LinkedIn account. Uh, at the UI we do have uh, an UI, an UI page uh, with, which is to me it's extremely extremely effective in communicating what the UI is because we have about uh, uh, 50 uh, spontaneous feedback about the life of the UI from our alumni, which is great. Now, whether for you, academic, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a, a good idea to have a LinkedIn account, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. I need to maybe like, look at it more in details. But uh, the answer is it's probably always the same. It's uh, don't do it uh, until you are 100% sure that you can pay back and have a, just don't have it just to have it. Just if you know that maybe through LinkedIn I can get some job offers, try it, make a profile, very conscious one. Prepare it well. And then if in one year you don't get any, any, any job offer through LinkedIn, either you are doing it wrong, so maybe try to look where you are uh, failing, or just delete it. Don't be there just to be there in my opinion. All right, thank you, Francesco. I just now realized that I've done everything wrong since I started <laughs> my own uh, <laughs> social media things. Uh, but it was very uh, good to have you uh, explain us these things, and I hope we can still uh, keep on this discussion uh, later on today, tonight, and, and tomorrow. And um, we will now uh, have a few minutes before we start our new panels uh, up there in these uh, very fresh room of the third floor. <laughs> Thank you.